today I want to talk about Tech Tight um, and the Tech Tight Tech Tight missions. Uh, for those who don't know, with Atlanta Sea Colony being uh, or having the goal of putting habitats underwater, Tech Tight was habitat uh, formed by different government, scientists, universities, um, and industries. One of the major ones was GE, General Electric, um, and back in the late 60s and 69, this habitat was put together uh, and sunk in the Virgin Islands, uh, Lamashire Bay. Um, when I say GE, when I first come across Tektite, I had assumed it was General Dynamics Electric who made the submarines. Since Tektite was involved, or government was involved with Tektite, and I was wrong. It was actually General Electric, the the company, not the submarine company. Uh, and that's why I put in my notes about it. Just because being an underwater thing, I assume it was submarines, and I was wrong. <laughs> so, what was GE's involved? I mean, what was their interest in it? They, I, I don't know what their interest was. I, I had a hard time finding, but I it said um, they had a, a big hand in designing it. So that makes me wonder if mm. you know a lot of the electrical stuff for it was was GE's involvement or if they yeah. actually had involvement in the actual structure of it. Um, some of the things that were noted uh, in, in some of the places about Tektite is the fact that it had a, a you know, uh, working refrigerator, freezer, um, things that draw a lot of power. Uh, even in today's world with the efficiency we have, things that are drawing a lot of power underwater. But they're um, all GE brand too. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, if I could find a good enough photo, it'd be interesting if you could zoom in to see if that's what it was, this GE brand. But um, the, the way this thing was designed is uh, it's two, basically two cylinders, side by side and a description i thought of is if you took two paper towel rolls and put them on a donut box side by side that's that's kind of what it looks like um there was a connecting tunnel at the top of the not the very top but at the top's end of the paper towel tubes if you will um, that connected the two cylinders it was four rooms in all the total of four rooms uh, two rooms Two, so two levels on in each cylinder, um, one on top of the other. And one was a main living area. One was a, the bridge is what they call it. So it was like a communications, uh, mostly communications where they would communicate with the surface, but it was also a working lab for the scientists because that's something about tech type uh, with the universities and scientists being involved and it's so heavily they did a lot of uh, um, studies on and they very specifically and everything i read about it very specifically uh, nocturnal you know daytime and nighttime living of uh, underwater marine life mm. so they they were really looking into it uh, hardcore i guess you'd say at that point the first mission, so Tech Type 1, and that's what actually separates the different uh, Tech Type 1 and Tech Type 2. If you read about it, it's the same habitat building. It's the same structure, but it was separated by the mission sets is what actually separated it. So the first mission set was basically the proof it could be done. Uh, similar to uh, Cousteau's work, you know, proof of what could be done. And NASA, uh, I don't know how much government was NASA, but NASA also had a big interest in it. So as much as 
the scientists, the, the people staying in the habitat were there. Uh, they were also being studied by surface, uh, you know, a surface crew. The habitat itself was powered by uh, powered and the plumbing, the, the strut, the, um, generator i guess you'd say most of it was offshore but some of it was inside the building itself inside the habitat itself because the top tier of the other structure was an engine room that's what they called it and they didn't give a lot of specifics of what was in there that i could find uh, maybe i just looked in the wrong places but you had a living area, and on top of that, the bridge, and you cross the tunnel into a um, into the engine room, and then the next level down on that side was your entrance pool with a bathroom and laundry facilities, so they could do their own laundry down there too. So now you're talking washer and dryer because it specifically pointed that out too. Hmm. So. Again, goes back to General Electric, <laughs> you know, yeah. just a guess. Yeah, and something like that works, especially when you're usually, you know, you look at kind of, you're you're trying to mitigate as much electrical pull and, and stuff as you want, and you got some heavy duty stuff down there pulling yeah. that type of electricity. Something else you said that I thought was interesting was was the the differentiator between one and two. You look at Con Shelf and C Lab and all the different programs. There's a different habitat for each different number, yeah. and when I've always looked at pictures in the past, I'm always like, well, I want to get pictures of, of, of Tektite 1 and Tektite 2. And you can't. You can never find it. When you search them, it always comes back to the same habitat. And that's why, because they're the same one. But yep. you look, like I said, you look at Con Shelf, which we'll talk about at another time, too. There was three distinctly different habitats there, um, which I think makes Tektite, it, it, it makes it special, I think. Yeah, it does. They built it to last. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things that I didn't put in in my notes. I was reading, but uh, I wanted to talk about is because um, after the missions were all ran, Tech Type One and Two, you know, uh, this thing was taken out and dry docked and sat in storage, and then. Uh, forget the exact dates i wish i wrote them down now but that's okay it's roughly the early 1980s they refurbished it and we're going to sink it again for active use and the funding for active use that way ran out so they toyed around what to do with it and decided to use it as an educational museum so they parked the thing and let kids be able to run all through it and stuff um, but it just kept deteriorating and then uh, I can't remember, I want to say it was late 80s, early 90s, they let a uh, welding, a school of welding, kids learning welding and torches, scrap it, turned it into scrap steel. And it just breaks your heart to think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I was reading your notes. It's like, man, to be some kind of billionaire and just have like your backyard full of all these old uh, habitats that, you know, uh, yeah. that have no homes and just. Yeah, but well, you can't you know, you can't save everything, and, and it served its purpose. But yes, it, it is it is a shame. Yep, that's especially the the history that that was done with it, because that takes me back to the missions. You know, the first mission was uh, four, I believe it was four different people. Um, I have my notes here. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, what the specific missions were. You know, what were the purposes and stuff. Tech type was done after, which I want to do uh, uh, as much as I can find something on the Navy Sea Labs uh, uh, missions too, because that was a different habitat also. Mm -hmm. uh, they did their own. The tech type was after them, but Navy. I mean, this was they still were involved in this, <clears throat> so it was uh, studies on human behavior, uh, endurance. How long? Because that first mission was 60 days. It was four men stayed there for 60 days in, in, in that first mission. Um, behaviors, yeah, it's 
sorry I went over some of that already. Uh, I'm looking for the names of the gentlemen. There they are. Ed Clifton, Conrad Mankin, John Van Vander Walker, and Richard Waller. Those are the four men who stayed there for 60 days. And again, it was people watching them as well as them doing things every day. They were outside of the habitat for at least five hours. Uh, doing and, and, and how deep stuff. were they? Uh, so around 45 feet deep. Okay. So 13, a little over 13 and a half meters. They're uh, two atmosphere more or less. Yes. So it was kept. That is one of the things that I made sure to put down that they kept the atmosphere uh, two and a half. Okay. That's, that's the way they, uh, you know, because they saturated those, yeah. the divers just to be able to come and go as they wanted. And they kept the, atm they kept the atmosphere at two and a half um, atmospheres to, to allow that. That's what the, so for 60 days. Yeah. And then they would have had to been uh, allowed to decompress before they were able to surface at the end of that 60 days. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, that's, it's to give you an idea. So you're 45 feet down and each cylinder was 12 and a half feet across. And, um, 18 feet tall. Yes. So each cylinder is 18 feet tall. It's almost 20 foot tall mm -hmm. and 12 and a half feet across. So That's you're stuffing thinking. a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, at that depth too, I mean, really, you go to the top floor, you'd be almost at one atmosphere if, it, you know, if it wasn't equally pressurized, stuff yep. like two, potentially. Um, because it'd be up in less than 20 feet of water at that point in time. Around yeah, yeah, and exactly. So, yeah, that, that, that's why I, I know I made the point of, in the notes I saw where they kept it a constant two yeah. and a half in that habitat, and that's why. That and you got your waves above, so, right, you know, right. if you get a big swell, all of a sudden you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're 60 feet underwater instead of 45. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was the first mission. It was an yeah. endurance thing and, and psychological, I think, it had a lot yeah. to do with what they were looking at because the astronaut, NASA, was looking at it uh, for their astronaut program. They were looking real hard at it, is my understanding. Mm. They wanted to see if people were going to go crazy living in such close quarters together. And, of course, yeah. now we've got International Space Station where, you know, they're doing it all the time year round. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I still think I, I don't care what anybody says. There's still, still got to be some cycle. You have to be a special person to be able to do that and not be able to to come out and go to the mainland every once in a while. Um, yeah, that's not it's not for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that, to me. It's interesting to see what the sea setters are doing mm -hmm. in its own way. I know it's the surface. Yeah. But I think at the same time, you're, you're still running into the same issue. You're at the surface, but it's not land. It's not the way maybe yeah. if you were born out there, raised out there, it would be a different thing. Um, now yeah. we're going into the water world, sci-fi water world, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Exactly. I'd probably say that, yep. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, at least, so at least with the psychological, you know you can easily get on a boat and head to land. But in space yeah. or underwater... Especially, you know, if you're if you're saturated, you can't easily get and go to land. If there's a medical issue, if there's, um, right, you know, a family issue, uh, something along those lines, you're you're stuck for however long that that decompression time is, or if you're in space, how long it's taking you to get back down to Earth. So, yeah, there, there's I think that psychological aspect comes into play a, a lot with it. Absolutely, but to me. I always look at the economy of things. So, it, you know, you get over the, so you get into the future and you have it as a common thing. People live in, in habitats on the ocean and, and most of them aren't going to be real deep at all. But because of that, it's going to create, I guess you'd say an, an underwater ambulance system, <laughs> unless it's, turns into a big city with its own hospital, you know, right. place there. So you're going to have 
submarine ambulances and what will be special about them is they'll have to be able to decompress you if you're living in a place where you're saturated. Yep. You know, if, if it's not kept it, you're just your one atmosphere. If you're mm -hmm. saturation diving or living. So these, and I just think of that's going to be its own niche of uh, yep. a, a thing in the future. Then it, it, it'll have to be. The economy will just happen for it like like it has in you know in the history of Absolute, mankind absolutely. i guess <laughs> absolutely it, but that that was really the point of a lot of that first mission because except for the navy stuff the sea lab stuff not a lot was done where a lot of scientists were involved to really get their hands I guess dirty, if you will, on all that data that could be brought out of it and used for things like NASA and, and well, I I would almost assume that a lot of submarine studies were done because you take World War II, um, Vietnam had just happened here uh, when this was done, so you take all that with the submarines, you, you psychological again, yeah. you're stuck in a tube underwater. <laughs> there, ideally with habitats, you're able to come and go as you want. Look outside. The scenery is, well, there's scenery, which is makes a lot of difference for people. Yeah. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. That, that need for the sunlight um, is a big one, I think too. Um, yeah. And so you absolutely. get that as well. So so what other um, different um, programs or the whatever, missions. The, yeah, missions that they do? The, the Tech Type, that was actually Tech Type 1. So it was that 60-day long mission. Tech Type 2 was a run of 10 smaller missions. Oh, well, okay. Um, and uh, they... They said around 60 different scientists and personnel, uh, engineers, stayed in the habitat for those 60 missions. Um, there was usually five people in those missions, uh, but the missions were much shorter. They weren't, they weren't 60 days. I want to say they're like two weeks is what I, I want to say they were. And it was five people. So the bunk system allowed um, people to, to live in that main living room. Above that living room was the bridge. And the bridge had its own area uh, where they could pull out a, a cot or hammock. And one person could sleep there as well, right there and never mm -hmm. leave that station. Uh, so that you know, when if you're communicating with the surface or whatever you're doing, you're able to stay at that station, whether awake or not, you're there. Um, yeah. And, and it's hard to find, and at least I was unable to find a lot on this, all the 10 different missions. What you did find, though, which is, is cool, was especially for the time frame, for the time era. It was Mission 6, they called it. It was actually the fifth mission, but it was called Mission 6. And it was an all-women crew, and it was people that a lot of them, if you are you know pay attention to the underwater world, you would recognize the names of. Sylvia Earle is probably the most popular one, uh, the most heard name. That was her baby. And in the August 1971 national geographic um, issue she had a write-up that was describing a lot of that mission and I, i've always admired her because she's always always had a way to bring artistry um po almost a poetic way of, of describing and, and saying things about the underwater world uh, um and she does that just like, you know, yeah. just that she is her in that article. Um, and she does that in that little article because the whole article is first about tektite and then 
the second part of the article is about um, that specific mission. I, I have links for YouTube videos. If you're a person that's interested in seeing and want to know the history of this, I have links for his, for YouTube videos that are uh, uh, about tech tight. And one of them uh, uh, interviews Sylvia Earle and they caught the aqua babes. That was one of them. They had uh, several different names that they were called that uh, would make you cringe today. <laughs> but the, it's the aqua naughties. You know, yeah, that, that was one of them. Absolutely. The aqua naughties. <laughs> and, you know, in the day it was everything sensational, I guess yeah. you'd say, which that was another thing that I was wondering about GE. And I would like to know if there was uh, television commercials, mm. you know, this is our stuff underwater and it's so good to work yeah. underwater. It'll work, you know, for you, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's, I always wondered if that was part of the thinking of them being involved in it. That's yeah. uh, crazy. Yeah, I think that was 50, 51 years ago. Yeah. What's neat is how it seems slow as you're living it, but you look back and it's amazing how fast the technology for all that has just advanced so yeah. much. Uh, it's really neat. But yet, we yeah. still have a bunch of underwater habitats out there either for being 51 yep. years, too. So, Yep. But that's mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the thing you were involved in, the Ignition Con here not too yeah. long ago. Uh, so Sylvia Earle was part of that. Um, yeah. Jan Koblik. Uh, um, there was others, and I can't remember all the names right now, but that were involved in Tektite. Yep. Uh, and they were all on, a, on, they all live streamed together and had discussion on, on a lot of the underwater future uh, facilities and habitats, which, which is really neat. I know you've got that up on YouTube. Uh, so we'll have to put a link to that in here too. No, no. And, and what you were saying about Sylvia early, earlier, and I saw that firsthand at the Ignition Con thing where it was, she wasn't given a, a, you know, an idea, basically what we're doing. She just came on there and we asked her, you know, she was asked a couple of questions and she just flowed. She, I mean, it, it yeah. was, it was, it was just like second nature to her to, to talk about what it was. There was no hesitation. There was no, I need to think about this. It's just, she lives and breathes it. Yeah. And that's, I've always been impressed because I think the best way for me to say it, I always thought she painted painted a picture with her words, mm. whether it's just, even if it's just a, a scientific fact, <laughs> she yeah. still does it for you. It just, it's right to it. I was yeah. impre impressed by that. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Very cool. So any other f fun facts for us here about tech type? So yeah, the, I, when I say it's 12 and a half feet wide, you, the entry room. So the donut box part of, of tech type was a protective measure as well as a wet lab. So there was parts of it, I guess you could say it was their own little underwater aquarium where they would keep an eye on something by stashing it or, or having a specific place for it in that donut box area. But it also, if you see the pictures of this, had like a caged entrance and stuff because, you know, the horrible man-eating sharks are going to get you. Um, at that time, <laughs> that seemed to be so much of the popular thinking that that's what they did. They put these caged entrances um, and yeah, on first the thing, bars. And that's the first thing I thought when I saw those, those, those gates was, it was like a shark cage. And yeah, that's exactly. exactly. That's what it looks like. It looks like the side of the shark cage. Yep, and that's literally what it is. It's uh, and that's their entrance. <laughs> so yep. they go in there, and then they come up into a moon pool in that wet room. And that wet room, I, I know I said before, it had its own laundry station. It had a, um, a shower facility. Uh, it had a private bathroom. They said it was small, but it was uh, it was a toilet and sink there with your own private private bathroom, and then of course storage for coming and going uh, for wetsuits and, and, well, your underwater gear, I guess, would be the best way to say it. So somehow you they crammed all that into 
into that space. And it's my understanding the freezer was up in the engine room. That was so Bruce Col Bruce Colette wrote uh, an article about uh, tech type and its missions. And it's not real long. It's a real short thing because I, I attached it to be attached to this too, just because I, I talk about it. And his conclusion then was that underwater habitats are a viable thing for the future, which at that point they were just doing it for study points. Yeah. So either Bruce is someone who is really excited about underwater stuff like we are, or, you know, he's looking at this, say, yeah, it, it's the real thing. And to me, the more you look at it, there's so much of a push for fuels, foods, all coming from the ocean. And by foods, I'm talking uh, kelp uh, and seaweed and fuels, the same thing. Um, I'm not talking fish. They know they can make better fish farms than what are done now just by existing at that same place. Um, and then coral restoration, that would be another thing. They're doing so much of it, which is really neat, all the different places that are doing it. Mm -hmm. And just think, if you're living right there with it, uh, like the, is it Seasteaders? Is that who has already started building that into their bottom structures? Uh, ocean Builders. They yeah, ocean talked builders, about, ocean yeah, they've talked about, yeah. yeah, that's one of their ideas, yeah. Uh, because that spar or those spars that go yeah. down on the water that hold it steady, they're saying at the uh, bottom of that, they can uh, put that current that'll run through it that and shape it or attach uh, mm -hmm. the 3D stuff to it that they've got um, to encourage coral growth there. Yep. So they're, they're trying to make their own reefs, which is really neat. Absolutely. They can do that. It's it's one of those things where I think that it's it's like I'm, I think I've said it before that it's, it's almost a no brainer, especially when having an underwater habitat is, and you've got a view is you need to enhance that as much as possible. I mean, you want the yeah. beauty, and so if you can grow your own coral right there and attract your own uh, fauna and flora and everything, yeah, why not? Yeah, and you you know, eventually you're going to have enough that you can farm some of it for personal use without hurting it. Yeah. Well, babe, you got anything else you want to yeah. share with us uh, on this? this or? Not, not that I can think of on this one. Just, um, I would say if you're at all interested in looking, there are YouTube videos that um, should be attached here to this that watch them. They're really interesting. They're not real long, and they'll open your your eyes to other things, all the other involvements that were either came from or were involved in these underwater habitats. Yeah, man. Well, hey, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, sir. I got more. All right. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to it. All right. All right.